Hi, I'm Robin Carey, and I'm here at South by Southwest 2015 with Brian Fanzo. We're going to talk about, really about Brian. He and I have been working on a, uh, a project here with IBM, looking at the new way to work. But today I'm really curious about how Brian, who's done an amazing job of opening up a conversation about how millennials feel about work, I want to talk to him about, since he's our, our uh, target millennial here, our millennial representative of one, I want to find out about what makes you tick, okay? <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's dig a little deeper. So, okay, this morning we talked about how millennials are influencing the way that we work uh, because of their intense passion and their need to find meaning in what they do. Where do you find meaning in what you do, Brian? <laughs> no, it's a great question. And I, I often thought technology was my background. You know, I went to school for business information systems, loved technology. I think I really wanted to be a, a sports broadcaster originally, um, but I kind of fell in, the, in love with the, the technology side of it. And I, for a long while, I thought my passion was technology. But my course of my career over the last couple of years, I started to realize technology was a big part of it, but technology which really didn't fuel me. I, I loved the idea of teaching people how to embrace technology. And that also kind of fell into social media, it fell into a lot of the tools. So I, for me, my passion is drawn from really teaching people how to embrace change. So I really am fueled by if someone can embrace something new and it makes their life more productive or makes them have a more happy home or their work-life balance is improved, that really excites me. So I get up every morning excited because I can make a difference in someone's life if it's even learning how to work better as a team and those kind of things. So for me, I'm really fueled by that passion for change. Hmm. So how did you get into, so you're, you're basically running a, a consultancy which helps companies to both prepare for a millennial workforce and understand what that's about, but also you're sort of an external change agent. You're driving traditional organizations to towards the change that they feel is necessary but perhaps difficult to implement. How did you get to this point in your career? What did you do before this? So I, I, out of school, I actually, my one of the jobs that I still think affects me really a, a lot is actually I took a job, couldn't get a job in technology, uh, graduated in uh, 2003 in Virginia, and I actually took a job working for UPS. And so I was a, a Christmas hire, they hired 98 of us, and two of two people got or three people got the the full time job. I was one of the three, and it was a it was a great experience. They were very refined. They knew how to manage every minute. So you were trained on how how long it took you to take the key out of the ignition, how long it took you to get a package to the front door, wow. and that that methodology um, I loved, and I I kind of uh, took a leap. I I didn't really like the idea of the I had to have a certain amount of years of experience to get promoted, <laughs> and I wanted to get into these jobs. And they're like, well, you're probably the best person for it, but nine or ten years from now, when you have have the years build up, we'll be able to promote you into a, an IT role. So I, I kind of left that and worked in cybersecurity for the next nine months, uh, nine years, which probably isn't like the uh, the normal segue because I didn't take a single class in cyber in college. I, I had a fraternity brother that was hiring. He said, hey, I'll teach you cyber. You like technology. Got a security clearance. Um, so I spent nine years building a team. I went from a help desk employee and, and a big change in my life was actually a Friday afternoon. Um, the, the help desk manager came in and said, Anyone here want to go to Korea on Monday? And I just happened to be the first one to put my hand up. And he said, do you have a passport? I said, no. I've been to the Caribbean, you know, the Caribbean on cruises, but never been out of the country. He's like, well, we'll give you a passport. We want you to go train. One of our employees actually gave no notice and quit, and they had to be in uh, Korea that Monday. And I went, flew on a, a direct 13-hour flight to uh, Korea, landed, trained on the class. And on the way back, the uh, representative for the Marine Corps that we were there had messaged and said, don't send anybody else, just send Brian. And so I landed and got a promotion probably five levels above what I could have been working for and from there I grew that into a training program that had 32 employees we trained four classes a week around the world it was it was great we taught different cybersecurity tools as well as collaboration tools like SharePoint and and those kind of solutions so it really opened up my world I was able to travel uh, work with the active duty military so I got to work with a lot of young guys that um, one of my favorite stories was I was in Iraq and they, they assigned somebody to me and I said oh well you know what's your background how did you get stuck in this cybersecurity he's like I put iTunes that I knew iTunes on my 
uh, my application when I joined the, the army. And he's like, so they just assumed I like technology. So I got to teach really raw, active uh, people how to use all these technologies around the world and, and got to play in different countries, in Afghanistan, uh, got to visit there. And for me, it was, it was a wonderful experience. But I quickly knew that um, I had, had built a great team and had built it probably as, as, as well-oiled machine as I could possibly have done. And I was working from home. It was a great life. But I knew that cyber really wasn't my, um, my passion. I like to say that it was slightly like a war on drugs because when I did something great, nobody really noticed because hmm. the, 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 no one got hacked. It was hacked. the thing that didn't happen. Right. And then when something did happen, it was all your fault. And it was the technology or the training. So I made a real big pivot uh, at that point and left um, my security clearance behind, left the government behind, left cyber behind and went into a startup more focused on social business and employee advocacy. And, and that kind of is, is what got me here today, because I kind of realized I was able to see success both in the, the military as well as in the startup. And what I really started to kind of embrace was I wanted to help more people. I didn't mm -hmm. want to just be the, someone that was helping one company succeed or one startup. And the startup that I worked for, in just over two years, we went from 210 employees, 220 employees, to over 600. Wow. And so it gave me a lot of, a lot of great use cases, a lot of great experience that I could not only leverage what I learned uh, deploying technology for the Department of Defense, but also how the startup world was not only different, but same in a lot of the ways of embracing change, the differences in cultures. And so um, I decided to leave both of those areas and kind of focus on how can I get that message out to the masses, and that's what so I do now. So when you were working at the startup, you saw it go from 200 to 600 employees. Was there, as a consequence of that, was there a lot of cultural change? Did it change the company? Big oh, time. It yeah. was. And it was one of the interesting ones, it was, it was kind of the old guard and new guard. The company had been around for a while and built up you know, over five or six years to get to that 200 uh, mark. And so the fact that, that in two years they tripled in size really was a cultural um, kind of transformation, but also a shift in where the business was going. It was going from a, a traditional data center company to a cloud-based company. And a very innovative, forward-thinking um, leader, I was very lucky that he actually reported directly to the CEO a, mm. as the title of a technology evangelist. It was, it was really built around the role of uh, Guy Kawasaki, uh, Robert Scoble, mm -hmm. and said, do with what you can. Help our internal community, help our external community, work with our customers. And one of the things I quickly learned was so many people that were in that older culture that had built the data center and not really this, this new age cloud technology, a lot of them were stuck in their ways. Mm -hmm. And I, I started shifting my focus towards the new hires. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was probably the best decision I made for the, the success of employee advocacy as well as social business mm -hmm. is I started turning them into my biggest advocates. And as they grew, as their, their voice and success started to happen, the old school kind of either learned to get on board or unfortunately, we kind of had to make this decision where it was hiring and firing for culture fit. Mm -hmm. And so some of the, you know, we slowly had um, some of the old guard kind of leaving the company and that change started to happen. And it was really this, this new wave of employees, not, I would say they weren't all millennial age, but it was all of this new, hey, I want this culture to be this. I want to, you know, if we're a cloud company, if we're going to go deal with OpenStack type um, companies, we have to be nimble. We can't just be like a traditional real estate data center company. Mm -hmm. So it was, a, it was a great experience because I had lots of quick failures, especially I like to say I like to fail fast in a lot of things. And, you know, we were deploying different tools and the tool was a wrong fit. The culture wasn't ready. But as I focused it towards training the new hires, it really allowed me to you know, build up a, an army of advocates that really nobody could stop because it was it was that fuel of uh, people kind of going so, through. So, you know, when you were at DOD, you measured success by the, the accidents that didn't happen, essentially. And then when you worked for the startup, it was by how you were able to uh, train, effectively train a new crop of employees. And that's, I assume that's what you measured your success by, what kept you going. In your new role as a a sort of global change agent consultant, how are you measuring your success? So that's an interesting one. I think a lot of it, I mean, I kind of learned at the end of the startup was how can I leverage things that matter the most? And I started to realize, I started to work with marketing and the sales team. Mm -hmm. And that term social selling kind of came out for me that was very glaring because I could really enable the sales team with content and story that they never had before. And because of that, they were able to kind of link these things. So for me, the measurement is important. I, I teach and I use this uh, a hashtag all the time I call screenshot awesomeness. <laughs> and what that means is document your wins along the way. Mm -hmm. So eventually when someone asks that ROI question or asks, you know, what is your success? You don't say, oh, I think I did these things. You have like a portfolio of all these quick wins that you had. What a great and idea. It, it's, it's been... I totally need to do this. I, and, and it's great because when you think about it, you know, change happens, we all run into these bad apples or you had a bad time. And if you have that portfolio of awesomeness to go, well, you know, nobody's, nobody's changing, nobody embraces what I'm doing, and you click and open that folder, you're like, 
oh wait, I have all these success stories. This one bad situation won't really ruin me and, and won't push me down. So it's been something that I've leveraged across the board. I'm very lucky. I had a, at that uh, Department of Defense, I had a, uh, a manager that took me really under his wing. And it's that idea of reverse mentorship. He said, hey, you teach me how to use my iPhone and how to get on Facebook. <laughs> He's like, I will teach you. I will get you in the boardroom. the ways I, of the world. He will. And he, I sat in boardrooms and meetings that I had no business in, but it was because cool. of that mentorship. And so I was able to kind of, kind of ramp up on the business side and have built a, a great relationship. Someone I, I still in contact with on a monthly basis for you know, guidance and mentorship. And mm -hmm. I think that was kind of one of the, the big things for me. He was like, document everything. So for him, it was, I, this is what I'm doing. And so he could just tell the story. And right. eventually, I kind of turned it into this kind of screenshot awesomeness, which has been pretty successful so far. So um, how do you think you're a typical millennial? And how do you think you're different? So I am a tech geek. I love technology. I've downloaded more apps than um, I probably have ever needed to download. I love being connected, being social. So I'm very in that aspect, a millennial. Um, from, I, and I'm on the older millennial side. I was born in 81, so I, I think I'm right on that, that border. And I'm very, you know, very passionate. But I'm also, I've been married for uh, 12 years. I have three daughters. That's My, not typical. No, no, not typical. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, for me, I got married right out of college. Congratulations, um, yeah, by the thank way. Thank you. And we, we did it right. I, we, I proposed and with the idea that we're not going to have kids for five or six years. And we would travel the world. I had the, the DOD job. And so she was able to travel with me um, on this summer times as a school teacher and so we you know we kind of planned all of that out now right. I wouldn't say you know we are, we're homeowners we kind of built that kind of the traditional um, the mindset that let a lot of Millennials I think are kind of shifting away from that you right. know, get married early rent, and don't own, rent, yeah. yes and I and I think part of that comes into this idea of what do we value and I think on our panel today I thought one of the things that I thought was really important was we want to work for a company that values our quality of life and I think that's kind of a different mentality. And I think as a millennial, I very much represent that. I want to be able to spend time with my kids. I want to be, have, be able to have a flexible work environment where if my daughter has an early soccer practice, I can leave and go do that. And I, so I'm a, definitely a traditional millennial in that perspective, but uh, family and you know, really embracing a lot of the, the things that I value in my life are you know, what I focus on. Do you think, speaking of work-life balance, I mean, it's a, it's a struggle, and I suppose it's my generation, so I'm a baby boomer, it's my generation that devalued work-life balance until we were all going crazy, right? Um, do you think that the millennials have a sense that as important as work-life balance is, it's also important to be accountable for the work that you do? I think we're, it's still a work in progress because I think as a millennial we have to uh, a lot of the onus. We, there's lots of millennials that are outspoken that'll that'll blame people don't understand me. People don't, but they haven't taken it on themselves to tell their own story to build their own success. Right. And in this idea where you want trust and you want all of these things, if you're not willing to be accountable, if you're not willing to work to a, a, a certain metric, and you know, hey, if I I don't care how many hours it takes you, if you get this done. You know, work on your own. If you're not able to be accountable for that, mm -hmm. you'll never gain that trust. And I still think we're in that little that balancing act where we say we want trust, but then if we're not willing to deliver it, it's only setting ourselves back. And I think that's hopefully where that's changing. I think the work-life balance is, you know, is an interesting one because for me, I always thought that I wanted, I knew what my purpose. I always thought, you know, I had this purpose that I love technology and I wanted to really drive it. But when I found my passion, it kind of was a little bit different than my purpose, and I found that I really love helping people change. And that doesn't necessarily have to do with technology. And unfortunately, you know, or fortunately for me, and unfortunately for those that kind of, you know, I kind of mentor, they say, well, Brian, you're doing what you're passionate about. You're doing what you love every day. Mm. I want to do that. And, you know, and I think we talked about on the panel as well is they said you have to have done something. You have to have had experience. And you can't just come out of college. And I've, and I've had a couple of mentor, uh, mentorees, I guess, that I've been mentoring that said, Brian, I want to be a thought leader in this. <laughs> and you're like, you're 24 years old. You're not a thought leader in anything yet. You know, you're, if you're a thought leader in anything, it's a very small you know, niche. And I think that's what we're changing. I think that idea of you have to have experience. It doesn't matter if you're 24. If you have experience to, uh, you know, to that point, I think it's important. But that work-life balance and finding what your passion is, just that when you find what your passion is, doesn't mean you can work in that space today. I think understanding what your passion is and, and kind of having that as a focus is, is really important. No, I think clearly, I and mean, one of the reasons I respect you so much, Brian, is that you, you, know, you did put in your dues and you did you worked at the Department of Defense. You helped people who were on the front lines defending our country's interests. And that gives you a lot of street cred with, I'm sure, the C-suite and older people who are running companies. Um, so, I mean, you, you, you can translate 
to people like me why we should be listening to the millennials, and I think that's that's absolutely brilliant. So um, you have put in your time. You've done. You've been a change agent internally, as well as externally. Do you see yourself ever going back into another big enterprise and being the change agent from within again? Uh, I, I, I never say never for anything. So uh -huh. uh, someone had tweeted at me and said, uh, you know, about uh, doing a couple of different companies. And for me, I, I say yes. I for I'm very open to all possibilities. I I really focus each day on making tomorrow better than today and today a little bit better than yesterday. So for me, where this goes, where um, it happens, I love driving change. I do. I love seeing the success. I love building something. I built a team that when I volunteered for that position, it was a single one person that did one training, you know, every month, and then I built that into four trainings a week of teams of two. And just that, just driving that change and, and being that person that can really, you know, make sure you're having an impact, you know, company-wide is important to me. But I also feel you have to have the right situation. Mm -hmm. I think uh, too often, you know, I, I preach about, you know, hiring and firing for culture fit. And I think that also comes into accepting a job that is your culture fit. I don't, you know, if you're weighing, you know, salary versus salary, but the one is a, you know, more of a culture fit of a company, making that right decision is key. And so that would be for me, it would be have to align not only with my vision, but also allowing me to be myself. And I think that's, that's partially what, you know, working for the Department of Defense, I was always the one kind of pushing that boundary a little bit. And even in the, in the world today, I think, companies now are embracing if you're going to hire the best talent let them be themselves internally and if there's a if, a, if there's an enterprise that's doing that and our our culture set, skill sets match up I'm all all for it so I think it's that's exciting did you wear a uniform I did not wear a uniform so I was actually I was of our company we had 98% or so were active duty military and I was the one of the few that were not active duty military and I actually used to say the only reason I had a goatee was that I didn't blend in as an active duty military <laughs> person so where did you graduate with GS 15 16 no so I was a, so I was a contractor so I oh, so okay. I was a, I was a 12 equivalent whenever I I left there but it was nice I I had the perks of a 15 when I traveled overseas. Well, that's good. So I, yes, I was taking the better the, hotels. I, better hotels. <laughs> I had a I had a, a marina attached to me when I was in the war zones, and oh, you cool. know it was it, I never felt safer, and I it was one of the most rewarding situations working with active duty, and you know I, I still support the troops across the board, and I, if there's anything I would end up going back to is you know to continue to do work there because I think there's lots that can be done across technology as well as change you know in the Department of Defense as well. Wow, totally, totally. Wow, great. Brian, thank you so much. I'm glad to know you better. And thanks to IBM for putting all of this wonderful series together. New way to work. And Brian Fanzo, thank you. Thank you.